Hello, everyone. This is Sarah Longwell, and welcome to Beg to Differ. I am sitting in this week for the one and only Mona Charon. Um, Mona is a very classy lady, so I'm going to endeavor uh, to keep things uh, as classy as she would, but uh, I make no promises. Um, I am joined, as always, uh, by Damon Linker of The Week, Linda Chavez of the Niskanen Center, and Bill Galston from the Brookings Institution and the Wall Street Journal. Welcome to all of you. Uh, very excited uh, to talk to you all this week. Uh, I got to pick the topics, and so I picked um, three topics that I am extremely interested in. Um, so I hope everyone will indulge me. Uh, the first one that I want to ask all of you about, last night uh, in the Washington Post, Joe Manchin penned an op-ed saying, <laughs> in no uncertain terms, guys, I'm not going to get rid of the filibuster. Please stop asking me. Um, to quote, uh, he says, the filibuster is a critical tool uh, to the filibuster is a critical tool to protecting that input and our democratic form of government. That is why I have said before and will say it again to remove any shred of doubt. There is no circumstance in which I will vote to eliminate or weaken the filibuster. The time has come to end these political games and to usher in a new era of bipartisanship where we find common ground on the major policy debates facing our nation. Damon, first question to you. Is Manchin making the right call here? Like, Do you agree with him that he is just un in this call to just, I am not going to do anything to eliminate or weaken the filibuster? <sighs> Well, I was with him on eliminate when he says weaken, uh, I waver uh, just because Biden has floated the possibility of some kind of a compromise. You know, the the filibuster has not uh, operated exactly the same over its history, and it, it's 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 changed in various ways over the last decade or so. Uh, and I think that there is some room for adjustment in exactly how it's used, whether uh, whether actual, for instance, whether actual literal filibusters are required for senators to stand up and give speeches, or it's really about cloture motions and things like this. Um, and the fact that Manchin is saying that, in effect, none of that is even on the table, which is, I think, what he's applying by not simply saying that this is about eliminating it, but even weakening it. Uh, I think that is unfortunate because I do think there is room for reform that could improve the way the Senate functions. But, you know, clearly, look, Joe Manchin uh, – is not not with the mainstream of his party on a lot of things. He's incredibly powerful at the moment. I, I mean, honestly, when it comes to the elimination part of it, this is no surprise. He's made this very clear. There are other senators who have said similar things. So I, I don't really think that anyone seriously believed that there was going to be a path forward in the immediate future to simply scuttle the whole thing. Uh, but again, him him raising the bar to not even reforming it, uh, I, I don't know where that leaves us, quite frankly, because I'm all for bipartisanship in theory. But in reality, the fact is that the two parties have very little overlap right now. Um, they haven't for quite a while. But I mean, just I'll leave I'll leave uh, the conversation for now with just a little anecdote. Or a fact, I guess you could call it a factoid. Uh, back in 2009, there were 13 Senate Democrats in states won by John McCain. Today, there are three Senate Democrats in states won by Trump in 2020. That's that's a reality where where the the overlap between the parties is very minuscule, and frankly, within the next couple election cycles, could fall to something close to zero. And in that reality, in the Senate, um, there's not a lot of room for uh, compromise. Linda Damon's question: the, the the point that he's making about whether or not you could ever get ten Republicans on anything. Um, is sort of what I, I feel like I hear from Democrats generally. They just say, look, Republicans aren't going to work with us. Why are we pretending like they are? 
But what do you think? Do you think that there is that it's possible you could get, um, you know, if, if everybody was willing to sit down and do the hard work? Because that's really what Manchin's saying in this piece. He's saying, come on, let's get back to the work of legislating. Let's put our heads down. Let's work this out, negotiate. Do you think that there is, we live in a world anymore where you can get uh, that kind of bipartisan agreement? Well, we don't live in that world right now, and that is a shame. And frankly, I would like to see uh, a world that John McCain talked about uh, in the in the Congress, and that is a a world of regular order, where bills come before committees, where there is testimony given in support and in opposition, where the staff go back and mark up the bill, uh, where it goes to the Rules Committee and there's further debate on that, and then it eventually makes its way uh, to the floor of the Senate and the House. We don't see that much anymore. We've had really dramatic legislation offered that is basically just sort of a rush to judgment. I mean, it started, uh, maybe there were examples before this, but one of the examples that I think was uh, sort of the breaking point for a lot of conservatives was the Affordable Care Act, uh, which of course was passed on a non-bipartisan basis. And now we're having, you know, major overhauls, big spending money. I don't know what's going to happen on infrastructure, but, you know, there uh, certainly is an attempt to try to not go through the regular order in getting uh, these items. And then you come to issues like immigration, which, as you know, I have a deep interest in. Um, Immigration is not going to be immigration reform. Uh, There are items in which uh, I think both Democrats and Republicans can agree. Uh, But I don't think you're going to see any kind of major comprehensive immigration reform go through that process. And the question is, does uh, eliminating the the filibuster get us to a better place or worse? And I guess I'm with Joe Manchin on this. I think we need to get back to a world in which there is compromise, in which it's not an all or nothing game, in which Republicans have to give and Democrats have to give and you have to kind of work it out. And, you know, Joe, Manchin wasn't alone in this. I think um, there was a link at the uh, on the uh, online version of his article, which pointed to a uh, Ruth Marcus uh, piece called "Kill the Fil- uh, Filibuster and Reap What You Sow," and she painted a very dire picture of what could happen uh, in 2025 with a Donald Trump reelected, God forbid, uh, and uh, Republicans in control of both houses. And you could end up in the United States with something we've never had, which is a kind of very dramatic ping pong effect uh, between administrations where the goal of whoever is coming into power is simply to get rid of what the last party did in the previous administration. And that that would be a disaster for the country going forward. Yeah, I'll tell you, I um I'm with you. I I have a tendency, whether it's whether it means we're living in the in, in the real political world or not, I read Joe Manchin's op-ed and thought, yes, I would like this to be the case. I would like to force this kind of compromise and for people to get back to legislating, because I do believe that there's a lot of um, overlap and places where there could be compromise. I guess the question becomes whether or not um, there is any good faith left, whether, you know, we have destroyed, um, p- you sort of people are so mad that we're in this kind of Hatfield and McCoy, Montagues and Capulets, vortex of backlashes. Well, you started it. We're never going to compromise again. Um, and I'm not sure how we get out of that. But but Bill Golston, I have kind of the the bigger picture question for you, which is, what if if Joe Manchin is is true to his word? And I it's sometimes funny. I think Democrats like don't believe him. Like Joe Manchin just gets asked this question over and over and over again. Uh, and I think he sort of maybe it felt to me like he wrote this op ed to be like, please stop asking me to get rid of uh, the filibuster because I'm not going to do it. Uh, but but as I listen to Democrats kind of formulate their agenda, especially around things like HR one. You know, that's why they want the filibuster to go. They just think there's no way they're going to get Republicans on something like that. Um, they, you know, don't think you can find 10 Republicans on infrastructure. So if if Joe Manchin's a hard no, then what does this do to Biden's agenda going forward, especially for some of these bills that you cannot use reconciliation for like H.R. 1? 
<clears throat> well, uh, two points. First of all, uh, I think I think Manchin is dead serious. I've known him for more than a decade, and uh, he he means what he says, and he believes it. Uh, and I don't think he is going to be moved on this point. He will come under enormous pressure as the you know the uh, American Jobs Plan and subsequent plans that can be put through reconciliation are dealt with in one way or another, and then the political and social issues, starting with HR1, but certainly not ending there, come to the fore. At that point, uh, it is easy to anticipate the escalation of the rhetorical war against his position. And we've, we've already heard uh, epithets about, uh, you know, about resistance to, uh, to voting reforms uh, that are pretty ugly. Uh, so I'm not I'm not quite sure where to go from here. I I do think that, as I said, there will be increased pressure uh, on the reconciliation mechanism for everything that can conceivably be crammed into it. And as to the rest, there's going to be a big fight. I do know this: uh, there are some people in the Senate on both sides who are acutely aware of the likely consequences of total gridlock and total partisan warfare on issues like H.R. 1, and are really working hard behind the scenes to develop a bipartisan alternative. The Republicans will never go for H.R. 1, and not even as a markup vehicle. Uh, I think in order, in order to avoid a total train wreck, uh, there's going to have to be a different point of departure and senators in both parties are trying to come up with one before it's too late. So in that sense, you can see some positive consequences of the perception uh, that, uh, you know, that we're headed for gridlock and total partisan warfare unless we take a different course. Yeah, I mean, I guess I, I, I'll ask this a bit as a follow up, but it seems to me like what needs to be happening is that, you know, Amy Klobuchar is calling up Mitt Romney and saying, uh, hey, what, what would you go for? Um, and that there is, uh, you know, somewhere in H.R. 1, there's a decent bill that addresses what I think is the most existential threat right now, which is voting rights. I mean, right, right now, H.R. 1 is, you know, 800 pages. It's got all this stuff in it that is, you know, there are non-starters for Republicans. Um, and everybody knows they're non-starters. And so, you know, if you strip it down, uh, don't you, you would think that there would be uh, enough institutionalists left uh, that they would be talking to each other to figure out wh what what makes us all a little happy and a little unhappy um, and trying to get there, especially especially on the voting piece. Um, but what do you think Democrats are going to do? Do you think that they're going to hope that the people of good faith do come together to negotiate? Or do you think they're going to continue to just put up mountains of public pressure uh, to try to get this kind of wish list bill moving? Uh, initially, the latter eventually the former, uh, and eventually it could be a long time. I, can I, I'm sorry to harp on this, but I do have to just ask it because this is, if, if, if Democrats believe, um, and, and maybe Linda has an opinion on this too, but if Democrats believe that voting rights are about to be under the worst attack, right. That they've ever been in, you know, rhetoric, like, like right, Jim Crow 2.0, right. then, then why, why isn't there um, just kind of a hard-headed sense of, hey, we have to get something passed before 2022 to head off all these horrible bills that Republicans are going to put up in the states. And so, like, let's grow up, be realistic, and, like, you know, put, put something forward that could actually get passed. Like, why doesn't well, that happen? It's, it's early in the game. We are 75 days into the Biden administration. And right now, I, would, uh, I think it's obvious that people I'll call the maximalists are in the driver's seat. And they don't think at this point that they'll have to give much ground in order to get their way. Uh, when events prove that they're wrong, then and only then 
will some political pressure begin to build uh, for a different approach to issues like HR1? Uh, I agree with you. you know, inside a very, very big bill with lots of non-starters is a small politic or smaller and politically viable bill struggling to get out. Uh, but it's not going to happen right now. Uh, there's going to have to be a concrete demonstration that the maximalist path cannot succeed. And, and until critical people get there mentally, uh, I don't think we're going to see any significant movement. Could I jump in here, Sarah? Because one of the things that has been so disturbing to me uh, in the very recent past is the way in which we have moved from the time during the election and shortly afterward of assuming that we were going to see more comedy, that we were going to see people, uh, you know, giving each other the benefit of the doubt. That all seems to have been erased. And uh, I you know, I, I have to say, I really dislike the rhetoric around HR1. I really dislike uh, this uh, Jim Crow 2.0 description uh, of the laws that was passed in uh, Georgia. Both the Washington Post and the New York Times, hardly the kind of right-wing rags that, uh, uh, you know, might be a, uh, in favor of, of jumping on board uh, the Georgia law, uh, had pieces uh, in the last week that explained how difficult it is to depress voter turnout. Um, the New York Times piece, in fact, said that the changes in the law that were being proposed, I mean, you might oppose them on policy reasons or other, but they're not likely to have huge impacts on turnout. And the Washington Post uh, pointed out that some of the worst things that people are alleging uh, hap- uh, happened in uh, in the Georgia bill really have it and and I, and I think it's important because I think when we get into that we don't just disagree with you but we think you are evil and you are you know bringing back Jim Crow it makes it very difficult uh, to try to forge alliances and to move forward of uh, in forward on something that is more sensible. And I do think that there, uh, I happen to be one who believes that the Republican Party will never be a majority party if it cannot figure out a way to appeal to a majority of Americans. And that means that you want more people to vote and your program is more appealing and therefore they are going to vote for you. Now the game seems to be how can we depress certain voters uh, and discourage certain voters and that's not a winning solution. But we're never going to get there when we're calling each other names and invoking uh, the racist pass um, that, you know, this the Georgia bill is is many things in it as I don't like uh, is not Jim Crow 2.0. Damon, do you have anything to bring us bring us home on this? Well, I mean, I I agree with what Linda is saying. I don't favor that kind of rhetoric either. I think that what we're dealing with here is that. Uh, Progressives have decided, and this is because of the influence of activists in in the party, I think, that um, that essentially anything that increases the number of people who vote and makes it easier to vote is the obviously unambiguously better thing, which in general, I think is true. And I do favor making it easier to vote. I favor all kinds of reforms in that direction. However, what we lived through over the last couple of years is that the laws in a lot of states were in one place. And then because of the pandemic, they were liberalized tremendously, made much easier to vote, all kinds of new procedures put in place that contradicted the laws on the books in some cases, bent rules in all kinds of other ways in order, again, to facilitate voting at a time when you didn't want people gathering, you you wanted to spread out voting as much as possible, allow people to do it through uh, mail or early, all, all kinds of procedures were put in place. And a lot of states, including Georgia, have now set out to regularize things to figure out 
where are we going to draw the line now? Somewhere between where they were and where they ended up because of the pandemic. And that has the kind of the net change from November 2020 has been more restrictive. But you have to judge it against also the baseline prior to those reforms that were the result of the pandemic. And from that, it's a kind of muddled uh, middle, and some of it isn't great. Some of it is better than the way it used to be, it, but it is not Jim Crow uh, revisited. And yet a lot of Democrats uh, on the more activist side of the party have decided both that it's true that it is Jim Crow, but secondly, that it's good for them politically to talk that way because they know that most voters won't dig into the details or even read a New York Times or Washington Post article uh, detailing how it really isn't that way, that it's complicated and so forth. And it's it's bad for the for our politics, and it brings us right back to where we started on this theme, I think, which is why uh, why we're in this polarized situation and why it is so hard to reach that kind of mansion middle. Um, so, yeah, that's where I'd leave it, I guess. Great. Um, okay, well, I want to move on to our second topic, uh, which is that the Q1 fundraising numbers are starting to come out. And uh, they're not all out yet. But basically, what happens is, is people who are really proud of their fundraising numbers tend to leak them early, uh, so that people know that they've got all this momentum. And uh there was the big sort of, you know, eye popper coming out yesterday uh, was that Marjorie Taylor Greene has raised uh, $3.2 million in her first quarter uh, as a freshman congresswoman. Uh, during that quarter, she was stripped of her committee assignments. Um, a bunch of new information came out about her in terms of uh, her, how much she likes QAnon. Uh, there was a very brief sex scandal. Uh, there was the uh, tapes that emerged showing uh, her saying that there shouldn't be a peaceful transition of power the day before uh, the Capitol was attacked. And yet, uh, she is looks like the biggest. She raised more money uh, than anybody else. I mean, AOC didn't even come. In fact, Lauren Boebert raised almost as much money as AOC. Lauren Boebert raised seven hundred thousand uh, dollars, which also for a freshman congresswoman is is pretty astounding. AOC uh, just raised just over seven hundred thousand. So, Linda, I'm going to start with you. What does it mean that Marjorie Taylor Greene basically obliterated the field when it comes to fundraising? I guess it puts the Q in Q1. So I just, uh, you know, I, I look, uh, clearly there is an audience for this woman and also for uh, Representative Bobert from Colorado. Um, and I think every time uh, either of these people become the focus of ire on, uh, on uh, the media, the mainstream media, uh, then they're going to raise money on it. And clearly um, there is, you know, a sentiment there that she represents a certain uh, point of view and people are going to donate. But I, one of the things that I, you know, I didn't actually look at the, the total FEC filing. I, I'm very curious about how much money she actually raised. So many of of uh, the fundraising techniques that are used these days uh, really don't net uh, uh, as much money as as the uh, the revenue side would indicate. Uh, you know, they spend a lot of money actually raising the funds through direct mail and other kinds of contact. Uh, they cost a lot, uh, and so it, you know it'll be interesting to see whether she raised a lot of this money in ways that are going to prove helpful. And it's also, I think, important to remember that money does not equal votes. And, um, you know, she does come from a very safely Republican district. So, you know, the chances are she will be reelected. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't know why people would waste their money sending it to Marjorie Taylor Greene. But, uh, I'm not quite as, you know, the sky is falling on this one as some people are. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I've actually been doing a series of focus groups in her district in Georgia. And uh, I'm also interested in sort of digging into these filings because I suspect 
ver- a very small amount of that money is coming from within her district, right? She has been, I, I think you're completely right. This is a person who has uh, been elevated as a culture warrior. And, uh, you know, I think it was that she got 100,000 donations, average donation, $36. Um, but I, I mean, this is, this is clearly probably coming from all over the country when I, uh, you know, cause when I'm down in her district, people like don't even know that much about her. Um, you know, she's not from her district, <laughs> incidentally. Um, she, she kind of, I don't know, got an apartment there to run. And so it's like people in California, uh, or across the country who are watching a lot more national news probably know more about her, uh, than her district where they say like, she's not talked about that much. They kind of know she was stripped of her assignments, but there's lots of other things that they know very little about uh, in terms of the specifics on her. Um, But Bill, let me ask you something. And I'm not, I I don't know why I've assumed in my questions that you're the HR1 expert, but but one of the things that's interesting to me about HR1 and some of the things that I think are kind of non-starters for Republicans are the way that it continues to have this, um, you know, it, it really goes after Citizens United, this idea of, you know, big corporations being able to put a lot of money into politics. But I sort of wonder if it's not becoming an outdated uh, way of looking at money in politics. Um, you know, right now, people like Josh Hawley, even, you know, you even get Mitch McConnell kind of you know, giving the finger to big companies in a way that Republicans never would have done before. Um, But it feels like, you know, Josh Hawley doesn't care about losing his big fundraisers. He knows he can raise a lot of money from small dollar donors who want to see him out there fighting the fight. Like, it's clearly why Marjorie Taylor Greene did well. And so do you think that do you think that the money in politics, the whole conversation is starting to change as it becomes a more populist um, like the whole the whole way that that people are getting funded now is a more populist appeal. It's not cozying up to sort of big corporate donors. Or do I have that wrong? Uh, no, you. Ha- I think you have it exactly right, Sarah. Uh, and I would say that the reality is changing, but the rhetoric isn't. Uh, and uh, you know the you know democratic prescriptions on money in politics are taking out. A- on an increasingly antiquated and, obs- and, and obsolete sheen. Uh, for better or for worse, uh, in both parties, this is not just confined to Republican grassroots replacements uh, for corporate contributions, but in the Democratic Party as well. You know, people like Bernie Sanders astounded the political world starting in 20, 2015. Uh, with their ability to finance and finance generally campaigns that, <laughs> by definition, were never going to attract large corporate contributions. There are a handful of wealthy progressives who are willing to throw in a lot of money where it's legal. Uh, but we have indeed entered a new political era where a lot of campaigns are financed from the bottom up rather than from the top down. Now, there's still a lot of top down money in politics, and it's very it's very important for purposes of issue advocacy, for example, uh, and for other important political activities. But when you're talking about campaigns, the ability of individuals to command public attention, to attract zealous followers and to communicate with them on an hourly basis, both keeping them involved and plucking money from their pockets on an extraordinarily regular, in a, in a regular way, that is the new reality. And I think people who are interested on in legislating about money and politics, which you know is often a fool's a, a fool's enterprise, are going to have to change their perspective as the facts change. Yeah, you know, not to not to plug a bulwark product, but JBL had this excellent newsletter yesterday in which he talked about the new attention economy. And I think that it's go read the whole thing, but but it is I, I it's funny, it's almost like a be careful what you wish for situation where you we've spent all this time talking about, well, corporate donors and do they have too much influence and uh and at the end of the day, it could be that that what what we've wanted, which is well to put 
give give people the power, put the power in their hands, that it actually creates sort of a different set of incentives, which is as people compete for the attention and these small dollar donations, they're incentivized to be sort of ever crazier to break out of the pack, to get more attention so that they can have this um, these kinds of, you know, I, I don't think that people are going to look at Marjorie Taylor Greene's uh, fundraising and say, oh, she must be doing something right, which I think is a, which is a very scary situation to be in. Um, and, and Damon, it sort of brings up for me uh, another question, which is then, and, and Linda was kind of hinting at this, which is then how 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 people fundraise. And there was this incredible story in the New York Times about the way that the Trump campaign uh, was fundraising. And then Tim Miller had another piece in the Bulwark recently um, about the NRSC uh, and the way that they're fundraising. And one, one of the things they're doing is they're they're sending these appeals to people, right, these email appeals, and they're sending pre-checked boxes that say, you know, make my donation monthly and uh, and and make it uh, like a, a matching donation. And they come pre-checked. So you go to give, you know, $15 and quickly, uh, you're signed up, maybe without your knowledge, for uh, paying fifteen dollars a month. Plus, now you've matched it. And like the New York Times had this story about all these people whose credit cards were just being drained um, with this with this model. But Damon, what do you think about sort of the way that fundraising works these days? I mean, it seems like it. I mean, it seems like pretty close to a Nigerian prince to me from like scam <laughs> territory. But, uh, but, but, but for, uh, you know, this is like the way things are being done now. And so how do you see this changing the game? Well, I, I think what you're seeing is, is a continuation of long term trends on one front, you've you've seen now for at least the last 20 years, the collapse of the distinction between politics and entertainment, where Fox News and talk radio on the right and then on the left, you have kind of the uh, the late night t- talk show hosts and, and others, comedians who who treat politics as a, a form of sport where people kind of are cheering on their own side and, and like the most outrageous thing uh, that can be said. And then that makes them applaud and excited and, and engaged with, with the political conversation in that way as a form of entertainment. And of course you had Donald Trump as the most vivid example of politics as entertainment and, um, with his tweets serving as almost 24-7 little uh, drops of goldfish food in the tank where everyone goes crazy for it. Um, But then on the other side is the fundraising side, where you're seeing now a collapse of the distinction between political fundraising and the kind of digitally-based subscriber-based appeals. I mean, that's where this comes from, is if if I... if I sign up for a journalist Substack or a magazine subscription or anything that I click on online, it turns out that usually the default setting for that subscription is going to be auto renewal. And those who are pretty sophisticated about doing business online are aware of that. And you kind of know to scroll down, find the auto renewal and unclick it if you don't want to be in that situation. But lots of people are not sophisticated at that level. And so the hope in all of these cases, non-political too, is that a certain percentage of the people who click will not know that that is happening and that even if they don't want to continue subscribing, they won't notice it for several months and maybe not for even years. I'm sure a certain percentage never figure it out and just don't realize in their bill that there's 10 or 20 or $50 every month going to the same thing. And eventually they figure it out. And usually if you're, if you're able to negotiate online interactions, you pretty quickly quickly can figure out who to write. And usually they're pretty quick. Oh yeah, sorry. And they'll, they'll remove you from the list. But the trick is that you want a certain number of people to be ignorant of the way it works and to end up contributing far beyond what they intended to. And you can make a killing doing this. And the fact that this has now migrated over into politics is, is frankly terrible, but it shouldn't surprise us because again, the distinction between politics and entertainment, and then on the other side, 
but politics and other forms of e-commerce has collapsed. And so that's the way people are doing business now. And then the third dimension, very briefly on top of it, is the one that you began with, with Marjorie Taylor Greene and the the nationalization of all politics. Why is it that, as you said, someone from that district in Florida could be raking in such gobs of money is because, uh, you know, hardline Republicans around the country sent her a ton of money when she was making headlines by owning the libs and triggering the libs and making them really angry with her and leading them to, you know, rip away her committee assignments. And so she became a folk hero to them. They sent her money. And now, even if Linda's right and she doesn't actually have three something million dollars in the bank, she has a lot certainly for a, for a freshman uh, member of the House. So I think you put all three of those things together, entertainment, e-commerce, and the nationalization of politics, and, and here we are. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, I'll just tell you, though, that one of the funny things about that and our uh, the National Republican Senatorial Committee fundraiser is that the, the thing that they were using as the hook was be one of the first to get access to Donald Trump's new social media platform. And like that to me was so wild because first of all, that's just a lie. Like there's nothing that the (laughs) National Republican Senatorial Committee can do that is like related to this former president's sort of private enterprise. Uh, And, and so it was just such a, such a bizarre um, and, and, and it is just an absolute then crossover. You're right. Of kind of, the entertainment and the politics like that money wasn't going to go uh to trump they were just sort of using that and it, like it's going to go to some random you know either senator <laughs> you know like they're it, it's just it's not even going to the thing that they're they're advertising so um i i don't know at some point it feels like um there ought to be a law. I don't even say yeah. that. But there it. is a law. There is a law. That's part of the problem, Sarah. There is a law. The Federal Elections Committee has limits on the amount of money that you can contribute to candidates. And one of the striking things about this, putting this, you know, re- recurring, uh, taking money out of people's bank accounts or on their credit cards, ignores the fact that you can only contribute as a person, I think it's $2,800 now, uh, to a candidate. Uh, individually. And at the very least, they should have had a mechanism in there that stopped that. And of course, as a result, they've had to return the money that was illegally taken. Um, and, you know, and and so the, they ignored the law. I mean, I thought Republicans were all about the rule of law. Well, apparently not this law. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Yeah, well, I mean, but of course, you know, if you set if it's set to fifty dollars a month, you're you've got a candidate who's got six hundred bucks coming in from one person and they're well under the limit and they're making a killing if they if multiply that by several thousand people. Um, So, I mean, there are I agree if if the person initially donated enough that if you multiply it out by 12 months, it goes over the limit, then, yeah, you probably got to return the money at the end. But you know, uh, they, they can make a lot of money between here and there. That, that's right. All right. Going to our third topic. Uh, so I want to talk about uh, these boycotts. Um, so obviously, uh, because of Georgia, Major League Baseball decided to hold its, I'm not a big big sports person. So I get the all-star game, one of its, some big thing. It has moved now to Colorado. Um, Coca-Cola uh, had, had spoke out against the bill. And so, you know, Donald Trump called for a, a boycott against Coca-Cola. He was then pretty just days later photographed with a Coca-Cola on his desk. He's a big tight Coke uh, junkie. Um, I recall, you know, this is, this is an old thing, right? The, 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 the idea of corporate boycotting products who, you know, whether it's the N- Nike over Colin Kaepernick, uh, Chick-fil-A over uh, their their contributions to anti-LGBT things. Like, this is a thing that exists, but it feels like it's accelerating. And it also feels like Republicans are getting into it more than they ever have before. Uh, and which is a little funny, just considering how much like CPAC was called, you know, 
on what was it some, some, some politics on canceled or something like republicans obsession with cancel culture and being anti-cancel culture and yet now they're really into boycotts um for companies doing things they don't like uh but i i gotta i want to ask bill galston like do boycotts even work like is this a thing that works in politics to change behavior it can yes uh boycotts had a big impact uh during the anti-apartheid movement. They also had a big boycott, uh, a big effect during the, uh, the great, the, the great pickers uh, movement, you know, Cesar Chavez. And so, yes, they can work. They can be a very effective forms of pressure. Uh, but what we're seeing now is not individuals boycotting corporations, but in effect, co- corporations boycotting particular jurisdictions uh, that are acting in ways that they don't like. Uh, that, I think, is pretty new. Uh, and it, it, I think, speaks volumes about the political circumstances in which corporations now find themselves. Corporations, I'm convinced, are making what they regard as hard-headed business decisions about when when to pull up stakes, when to change the venues of events, and when not to. Uh, and so this, this tells us a lot about their assessment of the, of the balance of political forces uh, and their projections about the likely economic and reputational impacts of these new forces. Uh, so this, this tells us a lot about where we are as a country and how corporations are making these decisions. It's a business decision. Yeah. Sorry, Linda, go ahead. I was just going to say, I would disagree with Bill on this. Um, And as uh, regular listeners know, I do serve on a corporate uh, Fortune 500 corporate board. Uh, These these decisions were made very quickly. They did not do an analysis, a financial analysis of what the impact would be. Uh, There's a lot of political correctness that goes on in corporations today. So I don't really think it's a business decision. I think uh, it may have been a decision that they thought would bring them uh, a certain kind of good media, uh, again, in mainstream media, and it did. But I frankly am, am troubled uh, by all of the politicization of sports these days. I mean, I was fine with uh, Colin Kaepernick uh, taking a knee, and I was fine with others deciding to join to do that. But baseball has been one of those sports that, which has been relatively immune from this kind of activism. And again, you know, in, as we started this conversation, that trying to bring us together, the, uh, the idea that we're becoming so divided. And now, you know, not even a baseball game can bring us together. You know, there there are now, you know, only two teams, a red team and a blue team, and you're on one or the other. And everything you do in life, you know, the movies you watch, the uh, soft drinks you buy, uh, you know, where you go to vacation and what sports uh, you're going to watch seem to be determined by uh, our political leanings. And, And I don't think that's healthy. Uh, Linda, could I ask you a question? Sure. Uh, uh, since since you've you are having an experience, I suspect the rest of us have not had, and I know I haven't. Uh, you know, how long do CEOs last if they make major decision, major corporate decisions on? factors that include what you're calling political correctness. Is that a, is that a viable CEO strategy for the long term? I really doubt it. Uh, it wouldn't be if it had an inf- effect on the bottom that's what line. I'm, that's CEOs, what I'm saying. You know, this, yeah, you know. Right. If, if, you, if you actually had a successful boycott of, you know, Coca-Cola and sales started to fall all over the country, uh, then you might see some kickback. But the fact is, I think most boycotts, despite the ones that you mentioned, um, are not successful in having dramatic swings. Um, and so, yeah, you know, I, I think there is uh, a tendency towards uh, wokeness now in the corporate community that was not there 30 years ago. Uh, CEOs are younger. Um, they have been educated in elite schools primarily. Um, 
where they got, you know, a kind of, I think, liberal education, not just in the sense of broad, but uh, in terms of politics as well. And so I think you're seeing uh, certainly, you know, since the uh, summer uh, reckoning we had last year on, on the race issues, I see. I think you're seeing a lot of, of wokeness uh, in the corporate community that may or may not last. But as long as the companies are making money and their profits are high and their earnings per share are good, uh, you're not going to see companies firing their CEOs. Yeah, I would just add to that. I mean, I think uh, part of it is that the workforce, it's the, the workforce is demanding it, right? The, the employees of a lot of these organizations want to see the corporations that they work for taking stands on things that matter to them for better or worse. And I think there's in a, cause I, I also come out of the business world. I think there was, you know, 20 years ago, a CEO would have been incredibly loath to get into uh, the culture war. And if their staff was telling, you know, was, was pushing it, they would sort of shut that down really quickly. Uh, whereas now the environment seems to be, uh, you know, the, I think the, these corporations feel a tremendous amount of internal pressure, not even market pressure, but just internal pressure um, to, to stand up for things that they might otherwise have sat out. But it's not the rank and file workers. Uh, it's yeah, the, I, I, it's, it's, I the work, it's the workers in the in the in the C suite. The C suite, right. yeah, 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 sure, exactly. Oh, okay. If that's what you meant, then I agree. Okay, I thought I thought you also meant uh, sort of like you know assembly line workers or like people delivering Coca Cola. No, 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 no. No, I think it's. I think as Linda said, I, I just agree that it's it's people who have been educated in in these elite institutions, and um, no, I, I definitely I'm definitely talking about this sort of C suite. Types, But hey, Linda, can I just go back to something? Because one of the things that's interesting to me that feels like maybe a change is the way that, you know, Republicans used to have, I don't, I don't know that it was a religion exactly, but you did not speak ill of, of our corporate benefactors, of the free market job creators. And there seems to be both a new um, kind of not just willingness, but a zeal to taking on corporations, whether it's big tech, but, or just other corporations. Um, and then also a, a new openness to kind of a pro union bent as the Republicans kind of, you know, figure out who they're going to be now. And as the party of the working class, you know, you see Marco Rubio kind of trying to make that make, you know, go, go woke, go broke a hashtag. Um, what is, what is happening? Do you like, what's going on within the Republican party? That's, that's shifting it, it, this dynamic. It's exactly what you're suggesting. I mean, I think it really is uh, the Steve Bannon effect, the, the effect of four years of Donald Trump, and you know the uh, the the basically the the um, way in which the um, uh, Republicans are now trying to reach uh, those working class voters um, that they uh, would have issued in in uh, eras past. Uh, they want to be a populist party. I mean, it started, I think, with the uh, with the Tea Party, but it is expanded. Uh, and the the most interesting thing to me is what you suggested in terms of being friendlier on labor issues. I mean, there was a time when there were labor friendly Republicans. They tended to be from northeastern states that were heavily unionized, uh, and you know, you had people like Specter who um, had a lot of support. Uh, among, um, he was a Republican from Pennsylvania, had a lot of um, support among union workers. But you're seeing that attempt now. Uh, and, uh, you know, in, in some ways, that may be a healthy thing. Okay. Um, hey, Damon, one last question on the boycotts. Yeah. You know, I, I, like I said, I've been doing these focus groups in Georgia. And one of the things that people say when they are kind of, you know, sounding off about the Major League Baseball's decision and they're they're angry about it, um, they always they, they do kind of a well, what about China? Why aren't we boycotting China? Um, do you think that we should be uh, boycotting the the Olympics in China? <sighs> Oh wow! I, I didn't expect a China question. Um, I, I don't. I don't really have strong views on that. Um, I don't really. I and I don't want to sort of collapse it into the boycott question domestically, just because there are so many different consequences on the world stage of engaging in that kind of a boycott. 
Um, I mean, the, the reality is that uh, my view on foreign policy is that we, uh, for the most part, should not make these kinds of decisions because of uh, out of uh, simply moral uh, considerations. I know that that might place me on the other side of things than many of you here uh, on the podcast. I, I believe in making these decisions on the basis of uh, pretty clear kind of realist based considerations about national interest. And I don't frankly have a strong view about whether our national interest would be advanced vis-a-vis -vis China by refusing to participate in the Olympics. Um, uh, so I, I guess that, uh, that puts me sort of all over the place. Um, yeah, well, that's okay. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I'll tell you, I, I asked the question in, in large part because I, I too, don't have a strong view, but would like to have a strong view. And so I'm, I'm shopping around for opinions uh, to hear what smart people think. Do, Bill or Linda, do you guys have, what do you think about the, the potential efficacy of boycotting China through the Olympics uh, as a means of sort of taking a stand uh, for human rights? I'll say it's, it's been interesting. I was reading about, you know, people like Mitt Romney, who obviously have a lot of experience with the Olympics. And then I believe it's the U.S. Uh, Olympic Committee are, are against the idea of boycotting it, sort of saying, you know, these athletes shouldn't be used as pawns, um, you know, in sort of the geopolitical, uh, you know, sphere. And, and but what do you, what do you guys well, make of uh, it? I'm so old that I can remember the previous iteration of this discussion <laughs> after, the, after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979. And if memory serves, the Carter administration responded by boycotting uh, the 1980 Olympics, and which, which I, I can't remember where they were held, but it may actually have been Moscow. Uh, I, can ch I can check on this, but uh, uh, the Carter administration decided that this was, an, you know, this was an occasion that demanded a very clear moral statement on behalf of the United States and a willingness to sacrifice something in order to make that statement. And I can't prove this, but my sense is that that boycott helped to galvanize opinion and to, and, and to create sentiments both within our borders and beyond our borders that contributed to the strong stance against the Soviet unions that, Union that we adopted and maintained throughout most of the 1980s until the wall fell and the Soviet Union collapsed. So I'm not prepared to say that on realist grounds, even though I'm not a realist in foreign policy, that this would necessarily be a bad move. I think it should be taken seriously as an option. I, if I could jump in very briefly uh, on this too, because of Bill's very good point in bringing us back to the uh, the 1980 Olympics and Carter's boycott, then I mean it is the case that if Biden is serious in saying that China is committing genocide against the Uyghurs, then the idea that we would not boycott the Olympics seems pretty risable. Right. I mean, if 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 we think China is committing genocide right now, are we really going to send our athletes over to their country and, and have these games go on for a few weeks in the midst of it? That seems kind of strange. I don't think that we would normally assume that we would do something like that. But that I think the fact that we aren't really sure what we should do points to the fact that we're not really sure that the term applies quite as easily as Biden has tried to make it apply to what China is doing there. Well, I, I, and I'll jump in here too. I mean, obviously the 1936 Olympics uh, were held in Berlin. Uh, we did not boycott them. Um, and in fact, as I recall, we had uh, uh, some black athletes that uh, went on to great success there. And, um, you know, that in some ways uh, threw off the Olympics and made them, um, you know, made, made us be able to make a point uh, about them. But I agree that, look, I think we should be applying tremendous pressure on China right now. Uh, boycotting the Olympics would probably be not the first thing that I would suggest. Um, but I'd, I'd like to see Biden get tough on China. And I do think there is a, um, a genocidal uh, uh, pr a program against uh, against the Uyghurs, and that we should not be turning a blind eye to that. 
Okay. Uh, I still don't know exactly what I think, um, but uh, it was a great discussion. Okay, so now we're going to move into the segments of highlights and lowlights, things we want to praise, criticize, or draw attention to. Uh, let's see. I'm going to have Damon go first. Okay. Well, um, I am. Uh, I have probably never in my life uh, singled out uh, Clarence Thomas for a lot of praise. I often, I haven't demonized him either, but he's not a hero um, for me. But I will say that his 12-page concurrence to a case that the Supreme Court dismissed early this week, uh, it's a case that grew out of uh, remember the issue where uh, Donald Trump, while president, blocked some people from following his Twitter account and they sued, saying that this infringed their First Amendment rights because he was the president. This sort of languished. It, it, it worked its way up the courts and then the Supreme Court let it sit there. Basically, they wanted the clock to tick out, and eventually it did, and so they dismissed this case as moot because Trump isn't president anymore. But Thomas wrote a 12-page concurrence to this um, uh, this dismissal regardless, and it's really interesting. Uh, it's, a, it's basically a 12-page essay about social media and the way that social media companies like Twitter, Facebook, uh, Google, and Amazon have enormous power to control speech uh, to such an extent that they almost rise in Thomas's view to semi-governmental agencies that rival the power of the state uh, to control speech. And therefore, he thinks they should be reconceived either as common carriers like utilities or as places of public accommodation like restaurants and uh, bars and hotels that are expected to treat all comers equally uh, in order not to infringe anti-discrimination law. And the implication of either of those things would be that they would be subject to far more draconian regulation than we typically assume that a private company should be uh, subject to. So I do I find this entirely persuasive? No, I think it's some of his analogies uh, are very unpersuasive, but uh, I wrote a whole long column about how uh, these are exactly the right questions to be asking and precisely the fact that these companies don't fit the model of either uh, uh, common carriers or public accommodations points to the fact that they seem to be something else entirely that is not like a standard business corporation or like those other things, and yet something very potentially threatening to American democracy and that we really have to think through perhaps only a certain amount of the way with Thomas, but think through some of the implications here. So it's very much worth people's, I think, time to to read this and think about it and uh, take it to the next stage beyond this uh, particular concurrence. Linda. Well, I have a piece this week uh, from Persuasion, which is an online publication uh, that Yasha Monk uh, started uh, this last year, and it is entitled Kira Bell, My Story. Um, it is the story of a young woman who, uh, she's biracial, she had a white uh, English woman uh, mother and a black American uh, father. And growing up in a small town outside of London, uh, she was a tomboy as she was growing up. And apparently when she hit puberty, um, she started questioning uh, what was happening to her and her body. Uh, She also found that she was attracted to young women, not uh, to the boys in her class. So she was sent off to a psychiatrist, part of the National Health Service. They determined that she had gender dysphoria, Um, and so she began transitioning to a male. Well, she's now in her mid twenties, greatly regrets, uh, what happened to her. She had a mastectomy. She was given, uh, hormones that not only stopped puberty, but actually began to, um, transition her to a male. And, um, it in, in essence had a dramatic and traumatic effect on her life. And it, it is a side of 
the tr- uh, the whole transsexual story that we don't often hear, and that is what happens to people who change their minds. And so I recommend it uh, as reading. It's very sensitively done. This young woman uh, sued the National Health Service and won. She was part of a class action uh, suit. Uh, apparently, the number of, of uh, young girls who are being given uh, hormones and, and put into transition uh, greatly exceeds that of young men, at least in England. It's something like 75% of the transitions that take place during adolescence are female. So I recommend it um, as a sensitive, well-written piece and tells uh, a part of the story we don't often hear. Bill. Yeah, I I want to build on the discussion of the, you know, the major league's decision to move the uh, the all-star game. Uh, one of the things that I think is becoming especially dramatic in American politics is the political homelessness of the business sector. Uh, there were all sorts of things about the Trump administration that mainstream business organizations like the Chamber of Commerce, didn't like. And in the most recent cycle, uh, the the Chamber backed uh, a large number, I think about close to two dozen, uh, Democratic candidates for the House of Representatives. And it is now being battered by the new Democratic majority. Uh, The entire the entire cost of Joe Biden's American jobs plan will be borne by the corporate sector. Uh, it has very few friends in the new Democratic Party, and uh, those that are friendly to the corporate sector are keeping their heads down very carefully. Uh, so I think one of the big questions for the future of American politics is whether corporate America. I don't know how this is going to come out. It's too important a force in our society, our economy, and our our, our politics to be shut out of the game entirely. But I think it's extraordinary that that's where the corporate sector now finds itself. Okay, uh, for mine, uh, I'm gonna. This week um, was the three month anniversary of the attack on uh, the Capitol, and. Um, one of the things that I could not have anticipated uh, as I sat watching the attack on the Capitol was that three months out from that attack, people would have essentially moved on. Um, you know, Mo Brooks, who spoke, I believe, shortly before the president of the United States uh, on January the 6th and said, today is the day that American patriots start kicking ass. He was just endorsed by Trump uh, for his bid now uh, in the Senate. Um, He's likely the the favorite in that race. Uh, It appears that while many of the um, sort of average people who did the storming, um, they are are many of them are going to, you know, stare down long jail sentences. Uh, People like. Paul Gosar, who, you know, was saying this is our Alamo, Uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, who said, you know, we can't have a peaceful transition of power, Louis Gomer, who says we need to have violence, you know, in the streets. Um, None of those people look like they are going to pay any kind of political or moral uh, price for that. And, um, And three months out, it seems like We've basically moved on on to other things and um, that it is not going to occupy nearly the space in the American imagination, as I would have thought sitting there watching it uh, that day. So I wanted to draw attention to it today. Um, that's it for 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 our show today. Uh, thank you, Damon, Bill and Linda for joining us. Thank all of you um, for listening. And uh, thank you, Mona, for doing such a good job on this every week. I hope uh, I did a sufficient job standing in. Have a great week, everybody. We'll see you soon. 